Okay, so I woke up with a migraine again. Today it's right here. Yesterday it was behind my eyes. I have to get the kids something to eat. So I have to get up. Even though my head hurts. Hold on. Alright guys, so I've been trying, I'm sorry about the one second video. I was about to say something and then my baby, he called me, so I had to... I didn't call you. Yeah, you called me in the middle of me doing a video and then it like chopped off at one second. So... You yesterday? No, today. And, um... I didn't call you, you call no, called me. No, you called me. Oh. Yeah. 29 minutes and 40 seconds ago, you called me. Remember, you're like, I called you. You're like, I'll call you back in oh, one yeah. minute. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then you called me back. <laughs> anyway, so I was about to say something. Uh, so I just want to share with you my morning. So I ain't even going to talk. I'm just going to share. And then I'll talk. I am open, just not to heresy and blasphemy. I want to focus on, I'm going to come back to Romans 10, but for now I just want to point out Romans 10, 9, where the Bible reads, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And what I want to preach about this morning is the significance of the resurrection, the significance of of the resurrection. And I'll submit to you that the resurrection is the key doctrine of Christianity. It's the most important thing yeah. that we believe, the physical, literally, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, Amen. that Jesus died and was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. That is the very definition of what the gospel is. Yeah. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. This is something that needs to be emphasized today when we give people the gospel and, and when we preach the word of God, the resurrection is one of the most important things that we could emphasize about the Bible. Now go if you would to Matthew 28. Let me also just point out that the very reason why we have church on Sundays is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why we meet here on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights. And that's why Sunday has been the traditional day to have church for all these years, it is because we're commemorating the most important event in the history of the universe, which is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the first day of the week. Look at Matthew uh, chapter 28, verse 1. The Bible reads, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Flip over to Mark 16. The only thing that truly upset me and bothered me about this whole thing is the ignorance behind thinking that just because I was saved in February means I do not have the Holy Spirit's discernment. That is just ridiculous and folly. So she literally said that there is no measurement of the Holy Spirit. In a, uh, in a new believer or um, somebody who's older in the belief. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. And um, the Holy Spirit will guide you. And just to be clear, y'all. I'm not one of these new believers who never open their Bible. Who only wait for Sunday service to learn about the Bible. You can ask my husband, okay? Okay. My husband, who's with me all the time. I'm listening to sermons. I'm cross-referencing in my own Bible. And I have my Bible open every single day. I am not 
somebody who does not open their Bible to learn something. Okay, so the thing is, is that um, apparently I was talking to my pastor's wife and she also said that I should be weary of people who do not show grace when they're speaking to someone and to speak down to someone is not very nice. And it's not very Christ-like. And so, well, while I try not to do that, I am pretty bold and arrogant at times. I can admit that. Uh, if, if I was to put it into perspective, I'm probably a, um, a Paul in the beginning. Because Paul is like very in-your-face and very passionate. And he was, he was awkward, obviously. He was very awkward. But very strong in his words. I'm the same way. And, uh, yeah. The other thing is, is, uh, I can back up my statement with scripture. Uh, as soon as, um, as I knew where to look for it right away, but I, I wanted to, like, kind of get other references as well. So I wanted to prove my point. I didn't just want to say it. I want to prove it, right? So I have the sermon up that I was listening to yesterday about why we, why we uh, have Sunday service. And then today, I took the references which he mentioned in there, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is the first four Bibles of the New Testament. And I went and I cross-referenced each phrase, and each every every single one of them says the first day of the week, which is Sunday. So, baby, every night when you come into the bedroom to come to bed, what do you tell me to move off the bed? Your Bible. <laughs> and is it open or is it closed? It's always open. And what am I listening to all day long every time you call me? Sermons. From who? Pastor Steven Anderson. <laughs> there you have it. From the horse's mouth itself. My husband has witnessed me listening to sermons and reading my Bible. I'm constantly growing in my faith. I don't just sit around when I'm sick. Even when I'm not sick, I'm learning when I'm not teaching the boys for school. I'm always learning, guys. Always. My Somebody to get married to. You know, and I'm not saying to marry the first person that comes along, but that's the right way to do it. You know, and I'm not, and look, I'm not telling people, hey, run out and get married right when you turn 18. But I'm also not telling people like the world is. You know, my belief, based on scripture, is that you should get married as soon as possible. But, but again, only as soon as is possible. Meaning that you're mature enough, you can do it financially, and you find the right person that you want to spend the rest of your life with that is a godly spouse. Okay, But this thing of just waiting for the sake of waiting, I don't believe in it. Now, if there's a reason to wait because you don't have a job, because you don't have any way to support a family, because you're immature and childish, or because you don't have the right, you haven't found the right person to get married to, hey, those are legitimate reasons to wait. But just, hey, just wait because you're young. Just wait till you're 25. Just wait till you're 30 for no reason. I don't believe in that. And to remain pure, you know, and not to go down that wicked road. And you know, you can give me all your worldly philosophies that you want, but this is actually biblical doctrine here. Okay, these are biblical philosophies. I'm teaching these to my children. I want, I want our church to, to understand these truths. You can do whatever you want, but I'm telling you what the Bible says. It says, let every uh, woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 7. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again. Watch this. That Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Do you see that? Satan wants to tempt you when you're vulnerable. 
He's going to find you when you're hungry and tempt you with the wrong food. He's going to find you when you're bored and tempt you with the wrong entertainment. He's going to find you when you're single and when you're, you know, when you're not yet married and he's going to tempt you with fornication and he's going to find you when you're married and you're not having a proper relationship with your spouse and he's going to tempt you with adultery. And if we're going to pray on our knees and say, God, lead us not into temptation. And if we're going to live our lives in such a way that we don't lead ourselves into temptation, we need to realize two things. Number one, we should try not to make ourselves vulnerable to the devil's attack, number one. And number two, when we are vulnerable, we need to realize that we're vulnerable and we need to take extra heed and be extra careful knowing, hey, I'm vulnerable right now. And, and beware of that. Flip over to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. You see, I learned a long time ago that if you, if you pack yourself a good lunch, you're less likely to buy something off the roach coach. You're less likely to buy something from Burger King and McDonald's and Jack in the Box. And look, I remember, and I'm not tempted by that stuff anymore. I'm, you know, if you eat healthy for a while, you'll get to where you crave healthy things. You know, you just got to change your appetites. But I used to eat a lot of junk food. I grew up eating a lot of junk food. And when I first got married, I still ate a lot of junk food. I remember when my wife was in Germany, I was eating off the roach coach every day and everything. You know, so I've been there. I've done it. All right. But I remember just the temptation because it was a financial thing. Back then, we were really poor. We had very little money. And, and you know, it costs more to eat out than it does to eat home. So I remember just being so tempted because every guy I work with, they're all going to Burger King. They're all going to Arby's. They're all going to Long John's. And it's a major temptation. So I had to make sure that I had a lunch and that it was a good lunch. You know, I didn't want to just have a, something that's too small, something that isn't that good. You know, I, if you had a good lunch and if you had enough lunch, it was a lot easier to walk away from the, the Burger King and the McDonald's and Arby. Now, if I eat that stuff, it makes me want to throw up. But, you know, I, I haven't eaten any fast food in many years. But uh, I remember one time I broke down and went to Taco Bell in Montana because there was just no other warm food available. I was out in the middle of nowhere and I hadn't eaten this way in years. I quit eating fast food for years and I just said, you know, whatever, you know, talk, I'm just going to do Taco Bell. And I hadn't been there in years. So I went and I got my standard order at Taco Bell that I ate every week for years when I'd be traveling and working. And this is what I would order. Two chicken nacho cheese chalupas. Then I would get three orders of nachos. You know, the 79 cent nachos. I mean, they're probably more now, but I get three orders of nachos and one crunchy taco. So I get two chicken nacho cheese chalupas, three orders of nachos, and one just basic King James version taco. Okay. And I would get that every time and I loved it. 